just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? The Facebooking and the tweeting and the Instagramming, all that would not exist without our understanding of science. So it's amazing that you took that as an insult. You mean true for you is different from true for anybody else. Have yeah, something to absolutely, true you. because I can't something think either got to be true or not. I can't, no, no. Greetings, citizens of Netlandia. Welcome back to A Really Radio. This is episode 154, and we have a special guest with us. But just to round out everything, it is Friday, May 12th. Yeah, that's it. 2017, where we dismantle the current <laughs> events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations that make you go, oh, really. I'm your host, Andy Cowan. I have with me my usual suspects. I've got Daniel Atherton, and I've got David O'Connor. But I do have special guest, Gleb Sapersky. And I checked, and I did actually pronounce that correct. You did. Thank you. Okay. So we do make mistakes. Some of them are going to be pronunciation, some of them not. But if you find anything like that, or just any feedback that you'd like to send us, uh, there is an email address for that, oreallyradiopodcast at gmail.com, or you can phone it in or text it in at 470-222-6759. Also, just a real quick thank you to our Patreon supporters, Donald Davis, Melissa G., Henry, and Daniel Duncan. So thank you very much for continuing to support this crazy little project of ours. All right, so... Gleb, wow, yep. you have an amazing record of things that you've done, and you're a couple years younger than me, you. and you make me feel like I haven't done enough. Oh. <laughs> that's <laughs> you just still kind have of, time. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. That's a wonderful way to look at it. Uh, so what do you do? You have intentional insights. You are an assist, assistant professor or associate professor. Assistant. Assistant professor at Ohio State University. Um, you've worked with the Secular Student Alliance, the American Humanist Association. Um, it's a really long list. What are you most What are you most proud of out of all the things that you've accomplished hmm. to today? <laughs> <laughs> what I'm most proud of? That is a great question. Um, in personal life, I'm most proud of my relationship with my wife. Uh, so we have a really good relationship. And that's the thing that probably in my overall life that I'm most proud of. But that's not doesn't go on my CV. That doesn't go on my record. <laughs> it it does. That, as, it, uh, as far as we're concerned here, I think it does. So that's good. Okay. Excellent. Carry Fair on. <laughs> uh, the thing that I'm most proud of in my public life is probably working to effectively get people in who don't share my values, especially conservatives, to orient more toward the truth and honesty and update their beliefs from positions that don't make sense toward uh, more rational positions. So in terms of specific activities, I'm most proud of that because that shows me the promise of the broader projects that I'm working on, which is basically to popularize research in decision-making and social and emotional intelligence for a broad audience in order to bring about more truth and rational thinking in our society. Now, plenty of people, the listeners of Orly Radio and uh, so on, are already oriented toward truth and rational thinking, but we are unfortunately the outliers in American society. So we, sad you know, but true. we can speak, yeah, sad but true. We can speak to an echo chamber of people like us, which is, you know, it's really great to have this space where we can talk rationally. Mm -hmm. But what I'm most proud of is going outside of this safe and comfortable space and going to people who are not already oriented toward truth and rationality and getting them to care about these things, which is the thing that's most missing in our society and the thing that I am dedicated to addressing. That's wonderful <laughs> in so many ways. <laughs> uh, we, had, we actually did have a, a conservative um, viewpoint on last week's show and really it, it turned out that you know once we really dug down a little bit you know start with the basics you know where do we come from what are we thinking about we really still have everything in common it's just there's certain things that are tweaked in a different way uh different, uh, different value I, sentiments one of the again he he will admit uh mr true uh that most of his political decision making comes from a place of fear Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, and that seems to be a right. common theme with those who consider themselves conservative. Mm-hmm. So, so glad. Um, we are really here tonight to talk about the pro truth pledge. Um, mm-hmm. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But you, since you, to work on what you're proud of with uh, reaching out in such a way, how do you do that? I mean, is it mostly like a Socratic method? where you're just kind of asking the question, building on that, and letting them question themselves into more rational thought? Or how, how do you work with that? Yeah, recent research in behavioral science shows that the Socratic method, um, what's also known as street epistemology, is actually not as effective as many other methods. Hmm. And the method that I find to be most effective is uh, something that I practiced something that people can go go and listen to, my interviews with people like Scott Sloan and Bill Cunningham, who are conservative radio show hosts. And I go on conservative radio shows pretty often and talk about, talk with them and have healthy conversations, them and other people. So, for example, a couple of days ago, I went on the radio show with Scott Sloan. Scott Sloan is a pretty prominent conservative radio show host, Secular reason-oriented people know him from his debates with Aaron Ra about the ark that was built in Kentucky. And Aaron Ra talks about him, you know, oh, this Christian conservative guy debated me and so on. Mm-hmm. And they had like a really kind of shout-out match. And it, it, it did not, you know, it was, didn't lead to an updating of beliefs in either case. So he's a strong Christian conservative. He had Donald Trump on his radio show. Now, I went on a radio show to talk about Comey, Comey, kind of Donald Trump firing Comey. Now, as you can imagine, uh, that's something that most conservatives like him favor Donald Trump's perspective, right? So, yeah. for the best part, yeah. Thing, yeah, that's a thing that, okay, you know, that's understandable. So, I talked to him about, you know, not, I didn't come from my personal perspective, which is liberal. I came to him from a perspective of an outside perspective. You know, how would somebody determine this sort of question when there's confusing data and we don't know? You know, not coming from a liberal perspective, not a conservative perspective, but uh, trying to be as objective as possible. Okay. So we all have uh, this, I talked to him about this phenomenon that we all have, which is called confirmation bias. Now, that's a thinking error where we basically interpret new information from the lens of our current position. So that's confirmation bias. It's something that psychology shows is really problematic. So in order to address this confirmation bias, what we want to do, a really easy technique, is to find people who have motivations to see the information from one side, but actually take the other perspective. People who have the expertise on the topic. So what I talked to him about in this case, in the case of Comey's firing, was federal lawmakers. Now, federal lawmakers, Congress people, senators, and members of the House of Representatives, they obviously have an incentive to see, you know, the Republicans have an incentive to see it in Trump's terms, and the Democrats have an incentive to see it in, you know, oh, this is unjustified. Republicans have an incentive to see it as justified. So what we want to do in this case is see whether anyone broke ranks, whether any Republicans criticized this move or any Democrats supported this move. Now, when we look at the list of Republican Democrats and uh, of Republicans and Democrats, we see that pretty much all Democrats criticized this and called for a special investigation. When we look at Republicans, we see that some plenty of mainstream, typically conservative Republicans, like Bob Corker or Richard Burr, broke ranks and said that this was a bad move. They have really real concerns about this. There are over 40 Congress people from the Republican side, senators and the House of Representatives members, who said that this is a bad thing. So therefore, from an external perspective, we can see that the evidence that we have, you know, an alien coming down to Earth without any political perspective, would see that the evidence tends to suggest that firing Comey was a bad, unjustified move related more to the Russia investigation than to, you know, the actual claims by the Trump camp of um, Comey being incompetent around Hillary Clinton's investigation. Right. So this, and he updated as a result. He was saying, yes, this makes sense. You count the numbers. 
you look at where people stand, and this is a way of addressing confirmation bias. So, yeah, he updated and he agreed that, yes, it seems like based on this very reasonable course of evaluating the situation, based on behavioral science, he can agree that uh, firing Comey looks like an unjustified move. Okay, but that seems like you're using facts in an emotional-based fight. I am. I'm I've... using facts, but I'm orienting toward things that are clearly determinable. And I'm talking about how our brain... So I'm going to him. I'm not saying you're wrong for feeling that Trump is right. I'm saying that we all have political biases. We all have this confirmation bias. Now, you know, I might have a confirmation bias be because I'm a liberal. You might have a confirmation bias because you're conservative. Let's step outside of the situation. What would a neutral external observer say? Do people who have a, a dog in the fight, mm -hmm. you know, a dog in the race, do they actually bet on the other side's dog? And we see that there are some who do, and that's pretty strong evidence. So really, it's, it's using the evidence, but it's approaching the evidence from a neutral uh, position. So It's approaching the evidence yeah, from a behavioral science position, from saying... So what you want to do is you don't want to tell the person that his feelings are wrong. He may feel that Trump is right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I may feel that Trump is wrong. And we're saying, okay, you know, f feelings, um, there's a, this term called emotional reasoning. Yeah. Emotional reasoning basically causes us to feel that whatever we feel is true and whatever we're comfortable with feeling that's true. And confirmation bias is just a part of it. Yeah, it just reinforces so, itself over and over again. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So whatever we feel is true, we believe it is true. Well, that's a mistaken mode of thinking. You know, sure. we might feel that we have a million dollars in the bank, <laughs> hmm. but we don't. Or we might feel that we want to take a second piece of chocolate cake, but that's, you know, not really good for our health, right? That may not be actually what we need to do. That's true, so, but I'll probably still take the cake. Now, as as far as <laughs> as far as this argument goes, though, so just to try and reiterate it so that I know that I'm getting it. Um, mm -hmm. If we if we addressed it by where they're sitting, you know, not changing the viewpoint, then everything is viewed through their lenses. If we view it from ours, again, same biased lenses for where we are. So by putting us both, both parties, into a neutral position, we leave our 3D glasses, you know, in our seats, and we get to have a fresh look at the whole situation, and then we can reevaluate the facts based on their own merit and not based on our own intentional biases or unintentional biases. Yes, that's right. Okay. And to do that, you need to start with the person's emotions. You need to tell that person that his emotions are not wrong inherently, that his feelings are valid, what he's feeling about Trump or about Comey. But then we need to step, We need, sometimes our feelings lie to us, and then and through this confirmation bias, that's what I talked to Scott Sloan about. And then we need to step outside of our feelings to actually determine the situation with objective evidence. I love it. I love it. Okay. So <clears throat> the evolution of this is the pro-truth pledge. Mm -hmm. That's so, right. So, so tell us about that. How, how did that get started? Because I saw it go, you know, super viral. So <laughs> you got that going for you, which is excellent. That's, Thank you. that's not always easy to do, and this is a big deal. So, so how? tell us about it. Yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about it first. So the Pro-Truth Pledge, at protruthpledge.org for your listeners and viewers, and I recommend all of them to go check it out at protruthpledge.org while we talk about it. And again, that's protruthpledge.org. So go check it out. And we'll also have see what it says. we'll also have all the links in the show notes. So later on, you can you can look in the description field. You can look at the show notes at areallyradio.com for episode one fifty four, and you can get everything that you need right there. And also find out more about Gleb. Carry on. Sure. So that pledge is meant to reverse the tide of lies in our political system, in the United States, but also in all democracies around the world. We have people. All over the world are working on this project, although it's focused right now on the United States. So this is where our biggest network of supporters lies. Now, it does so. It aims to reverse this tide of politics by changing the incentives for public figures. We analyzed, me and a team of other behavioral scientists, sat down and analyzed why politicians lie so much. Why do public figures lie so much? 
why do journalists lie so much? Why do commentators lie so much? Well, what we found is that the incentives in our political system and in other democracies around the world are unfortunately structured right now so as to induce lying and not uh, to reward lying and not reward the truth, especially with the rise of social media when we don't have the traditional media filters, when people can get to, you know, they can very easily fool others on social media. We can talk, yeah. we can get into the details. All the clickbait and here, everything, yeah. Uh, clickbait, uh, there is a lot of research on how easy it is to fool people on social media. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about that, but right now I'm not shelling the pledge. So basically, the, we sat down and we examined the situation, we looked at all the research and we said, well, hey, what can we do about this? And this is a problem. We're concerned. And so what we looked around and saw what uh, this situation means. Now, there are, there's, this situation is really actually resembles what happened in the 1970s with the environmental movement, where there was a lot of pollution happening and nobody was actually addressing it. So there was pollution of the of air, pollution of water, and nobody was taking care of it. There, there was nothing happening. You know, pollution of truth in our political system is just as devastating as pollution of the environment. It undermines trust, which research shows is so crucial for any government to function, for any society to function. Um, we can go into that too. But basically, it's really harmful for our political system and it would lead very likely to a situation of great corruption and authoritarianism, as it has led in a number of countries already. So we decided to do something about it, and we saw what were the best strategies that the environmental movement used successfully to address the pollution of truth in the environment, to both change people's behavior. Ordinary people started recycling. You know how hard it is to actually get people to change their behavior, to start recycling, to start composting? It's really hard. Yeah. Uh, how do you get people to start fact-checking? How do you get people to start calling out politicians for lying? Well, we can borrow some of the same strategies that the environmental movement used. And how do you get politicians to pass environmental caps? Like, that's a successful strategy of the environmental movement. A lot of stuff. The EPA, really great. How do we get put pressure on politicians? So the pro-truth pledge combines all the best strategies that the environmental movement has found to actually both change people's behavior and change the behavior of politicians and public figures to induce them to lie less and tell the truth more. That's what it's about. Huh. Okay. We needed you four years ago. <laughs> oh, Actually, yeah, we needed this back in what? Reagan era. No. <laughs> oh, oh, two would have been good because there was still the, – the demise of the fourth estate didn't happen until – W's second term? <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah. it, it isn't completely dead. We don't just have to go through its pockets for loose change. <laughs> it, 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 it was dead in the United States. Well, well it's still dying. It's, let, let, yeah. let, 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 it, it's not the death. The, the media in this country yeah. is something that's so overwhelmingly large and so... So well, many players in it, it'll never be truly dead. Okay, so it's but the walking the major dead? players can be corrupt beyond trustworthiness. Yeah, so uh, to comment on that, there was a really interesting poll done by Gallup showing that from 2015 to 2016, trust among Republicans in the mainstream media and fact checkers has fallen by more than half. More than half. Mm. So this was something that would have been great a couple of years ago when the Trump effect actually caused this huge fall in trust among uh, Republicans in fact-checking and mainstream media. More than half. It's, it's crazy. No, the is, demonization of media was something that was done by both Mussolini and Hitler in their rise to power. And the Republican Party over the last 30 years because they've been railing against the mainstream media for a long time long time well, the seeds of this were sown way back yeah it was actually yeah. there was the campaign against the mainstream media in the republican party was started by well, started by nixon so i've done quite a lot of research by this around yeah. this and yeah. he's the one who started the campaign against the mainstream media but trump really took it to a whole new level uh so trust among i mean you can you can trace the trust among republicans in the mainstream media 
it the it fell uh, in 2003-2004 during the Iraq War, when kind of we went and the mainstream media didn't really fact check Bush's statements nearly enough. Right. But then it stayed pretty steady from around 2005 through 2015, and then it fell by more than half. Arshi, from wow. Well, having yeah, most the, effective con in history. The war on the war <laughs> on terror effective, and damn, everything like that. Damn well effective. Yeah, effective. there's been also they've been doing full on character assassination of those that are doing the fact checking. Oh yeah. So mm-hmm. those that are just looking at the data and presenting it are being attacked for being humans. Well. Yes. They're attacking uh, ideals instead of the uh, the the people who are peddling the snake oil. Yeah. Oh Trust yeah, it's targeted. Republicans, Republicans. Uh, let me see what was this. Eighty-eight percent of Republicans don't trust fact checkers. That is su- very surprising. So yeah, you can look it up. It's the Rasmussen reports, uh, Media Matters poll. So reliable poll. They don't trust fact checkers. Oh, well, they don't trust polls either. <laughs> I mean. Trump is proof that they don't even work sometimes. You know, oh. we, well, there were we plenty of polls that said that he was going to win. Yeah, but the yeah. the pollsters yeah. did not believe the polls that they were conducting. Well, I, I mean, just uh, just cases. recently, again, looking at stuff from Gallup and and other places like that, the the number in dealing with this Comey case that stands out and also addresses what we're talking about is amongst. The Republican base, people who vote in primaries, um, eighty percent do not see the firing of Comey as anything wrong. Yep, that's pretty consistent with uh, other statistics on this. So, for example, most Republicans believe that Obama wiretapped Trump Tower during the twenty sixteen election. Most of Republicans also believe that uh, that uh, Trump won the popular vote. So, they is, also believe that uh, the Ark story is true, you yes. know, by most numbers. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. so the percentages of of the conservative mind that believe these things, it, there does seem to be a pattern, right? In what they believe yeah. and what they dismiss as being inconvenient. Well, that's, is it a matter of how they're getting the information? Like, is there a way to present these ideals to the... Is there a way to frame the question so that they say, yes, I believe that, rather than no, I don't believe that? So this is what uh, this is the project that I'm working on, as I told you at the very beginning, kind of. This is my... This is the focus, because most... Unfortunately, what's happening in the vast majority of projects to spread reason and rationality is that they speak to an echo chamber of people like themselves. They use debate strategies, they use rhetoric that doesn't really reach conservatives, that doesn't reach Republicans, that doesn't even reach moderates. It only reaches people who already care about truth and reason. That's one. Second, they support current institutions like, you know, factcheck.org, PolitiFact, and so on. And I support them. I care about PolitiFact. I care about factcheck.org. I want them to exist, but really, the 88% of Republicans who don't trust them are not going to trust them just because they continue existing and just because they continue to producing more fact-checking. What needs to happen is changing the minds of Republicans and conservatives and moderates, people who are not so already... So you're, you're, ta- you're ta- Yeah, people who aren't already you're, oriented you're toward about, the truth. Yeah. So you're talking about a, a sort of almost a culture war, <laughs> if you will, changing the culture with within yes. the, the the Republican side to again being able to trust the, um, media trust fact trust reason uh, to embrace what? it and make it a part of their identity trust. I wouldn't call it a war <laughs> I wouldn't call it a war I would call it a conversation and collaboration because if we if we frame it in terms of war it creates conflict creates hostility mm-hmm. whereas if you remember the conversation I put with Scott Sloan I didn't create hostility. I said, you know, we all as human beings are biased. Now let's step outside of our biases. What's actually going on and how can we evaluate that? So I actually help him achieve his goals 
and of having the most accurate information. And that's a much more effective way. If we present ourselves as caring about that, those people and as allies around the truth, that's something that is very effective, which is why the pro-truth pledge is a nonpartisan instrument that both Republican and Democratic politicians have signed and Republican and Democratic talk show hosts have signed and Republican and Democratic ordinary citizens have signed. What the Pro-Truth Pledge does, essentially, it's 13 behaviors. So again, you can go to protruthpledge.org and see. And it's 13 behaviors that are clearly nonpartisan. They're just, these are 13 truth-oriented behaviors. It's not telling you what is true. It's telling you that here are 13 behaviors that research shows are associated with having the most accurate view of reality. And if you care about having the most accurate view of reality, which, you know, if you talk to somebody, people would generally say that they would. Now, we can talk about whether they behave that way, but they generally say that they would. So if you talk to them and say, hey, if you want to care about the most accurate view of reality, here are 13 behaviors that research shows correlate with this behavior, uh, with these 13 behaviors. How about taking this pledge to show that you care about reality and are committed to it? And... I have found that there are a number of people who do choose to do so, far from all, far from all choose to do so, but there are many Republicans and many Democrats who choose to do so. And that's a really powerful thing. So yeah. I, I, have, uh, I have on my screen here, for those of you that are watching in video, um, by the way, I, I did unfortunately have to kill the, uh, the streams because they weren't getting any sound. So... That wasn't mm. working out. But that's okay because I'll composite everything together and you'll be able to watch it on YouTube. So it'll be there. Um, so I, I have on my screen uh, and what will be on YouTube the uh, what is on the pledge. So the protruthpledge.org. Uh, it, it's in three sections. Share the truth, then honor the truth, and then encourage the truth. So how is this... Um, how is it the stick? In the in the carrot and stick kind of analogy, sure. You know how is That's, this to stick? How how does this really encourage or punish those that fail to follow the pledge? So here we need to get into categories of people, and here we get into the mechanics of how the pledge works. So when ordinary citizens sign it, and you can see that there's a take the pledge sign a signature at the bottom, you could sign it, uh, and that gets you into a separate space where you can enter your name, your email, your address, and a number of uh, things, whether you want to get signed up to newsletter uh, for the Pro-Truth Pledge and receive action alerts. And you, you can enter your phone. So imagine, and you can also sign up to help with the pledge. Now, why do we want to do that? Well, the more people sign up to help uh, this, they Create, we are creating an email list and a mailing list of people who are committed to the truth. That's really important. Now, when we, you give your address, that lets us go to your representative at all levels. You can also choose to say that you want all of your representatives in Congress and, you know, you're from everyone from your district, county, federal board of elections, kind of, you know, judge, whatever, magistrate of various sorts up to your president and everyone in between, we will be able to go to those people, advocates of the pledge, will be able to go to those people with a list of addresses and say, names and addresses, here are the people in your district who took the pledge. And they want you, along with all their other representatives, to take the pledge. So this is essentially, this functions as essentially a sign-up sheet, a uh, petition to ask people to take the pledge, to ask politicians to take the pledge. And that's a powerful thing to be able to do. So we have this petition. So that's one aspect of it. Now, the other aspect of it is that you can sign up to be an advocate. If you sign up to be an advocate, someone will individually contact you later to get you to help with various aspects of the pledge. And there are many things you can choose to do. One aspect is to promote it to people who are your friends, uh, promoted on social media, promoted public events. We've had a lot of luck at tabling in various activities. So, for example, there's a March for Truth coming up on June 3rd in a number of cities. And we have had a number of people ask pro-truth pledge advocates 
to be speakers and tablers at these events. So we're collaborating with the March for Truth. And so that's a thing that you can be doing, you know, any of those activities. So that's one area. Another is to lobby for public figures to sign the pledge. And that public figures can be anyone from your local, you know, judge and town council, mayor, congressperson, state senator, and so on. And up to, all the way up to the president. You can do so online or you can do so in person or anything in between. So that can be another area. Uh, and other public figures, like let's say your journalists or you know, other anyone else who is a public figure. By public figure, I mean anyone who impacts the public sphere in their conversation. And third, you can monitor and evaluate whether public figures who took the pledge are sticking to the pledge. Now, that's an important aspect. So if you... Go, uh, you can see when you go to the take the pledge section, but yeah. there is a separate section for public figures. And public figures, uh, there is a section, I am a public figure and, you know, I'm an elected official, I'm on staff with a public figure. And there is a section there where they can enter a paragraph about why they chose to take the pledge and free links to their uh, social media, online presence, you know, website, anything like that. Now, that gets sent out. This is an important reason why we want email addresses, because that creates an email list of people who care about the truth. And this provides a strong incentive for public figures to take the pledge in order to spread their information to this email list. So we have bi-weekly, bi-monthly emails twice a month, which sends email updates of people who signed the Pearl Truth Pledge, public figures, to people on the email list. So they, those public figures get a pretty nice reward of recognition as uh, public figures who are dedicated to the truth. Now, that will certainly improve the career of, let's say, a politician who is trying to run for office. Or if it's a media you know, host, it will improve that media host's credibility as someone who is telling the truth. And in both cases, constituents who would otherwise vote for another candidate because they, would, they can vote for this candidate or they would be listening to this media host because they know that this media host is more credible, more trustworthy, and they'll get them more exposure and this politician is more credible and trustworthy. So there's big reputational benefits for politicians and media hosts in taking the pledge, especially good for politicians when <laughs> the person on the other side, let's say they're running against someone who, did, who doesn't take the pro-truth pledge, but they could be attacking that person for not taking the pro-truth pledge. Or, you know, what does that person have to hide, right? So that's another big benefit for politicians. So this is the carrot part. And we can talk about the stick part, but I want to check with you to see if you have any questions about the carrot part. It's looking pretty good for me. Uh, let's see. What I know the one of one of the apparently hyper effective things that the NRA does is they have a newsletter where they assign politicians a grade based on how positively they promote firearm ownership in this country. Do you have something like that? Is that or how how I guess how do you communicate out mm -hmm. the score or grade or rating of of politicians who have taken the pledge? Right. right. So politicians who have taken the pledge, uh, they have an opportunity. They, first of all, they have their first opportunity to, when they initially sign the pledge, that paragraph gets sent out. Then it also goes out on the social media of the pro truth pledge and so on. That's one. Second, they can submit additional content occasionally uh, to be sent out to people again through this newsletter if they can show. That they that the pledge has influenced their behavior in some significant way. For example, uh, when they would have, it, when it would be politically advantageous for them to lie, but they choose to tell the truth instead. Boy, that's really so, asking them to show their hand, though. Yes, exactly. Hmm. It is. It is. So this is kind of you know they, that is a way that they can demonstrate you know that they are being more truthful, more honest, that they could have chosen to lie and it would have been politically advantageous to lie, but they chose to say the truth instead, you know, because they took the pro-truth pledge. That's the second one. The third one is when they issue a retraction of a statement, 
because they find out that the statement is mistaken. So when okay. they update their statements, when they update their beliefs, when they acknowledge they're wrong, and the 13th behavior in the pledge is celebrating updating. So we don't condemn people for updating. We say, yay, great job. You learn new stuff. You change your mind. That's what we want all politicians to do. <laughs> we would like politicians to change their mind based on new evidence. So when a politician or any other public figure publicly changes their mind based on new evidence, that's another thing that would be included in the Pro-Truth Pledge Updates newsletter. So these are ways that they can get additional recognition besides, uh, so we don't score them in the way that, uh, on the radar. does, we do this sort of recognition for them orienting toward the truth in various ways. Okay, so you're you're feeding them name recognition for doing right. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah, but reputation. So reputational. Uh, that's also based on the environmental strategies. So reputational benefits, reputational rewards, have been shown to work really well for envi- for the environmental movement. So uh, that has great. That has really benefited individual public figures as well as companies and so on if they recognize as being green friendly. And so we can do the same thing with people being true friendly. <laughs> yeah. So stroke it, their I, egos I see, see. in just the right way. As yeah. long as they're I, being truthful about things. No, yeah. no, we, we like you. We like you. Thank you for being truthful. Mm-hmm. You may still be despicable, but thank you very much for being so honest about it. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, I guess the other side of the sword there would be if they were uh, uh, pathologically <laughs> having to change their mind. As long as they change their mind, that might be okay. Yeah, you know, I it, mean, taking somebody, say, for instance, who's on the hard right uh, against marriage equality, against climate change, if, again, in taking this truth pledge and then evolving in a number of ways. Um, one of the interesting things that came out of Pulse uh, and that tragedy. The Pulse was, nightclub shooting in Orlando. Yeah. Just to update. Um, there were a number of uh, Republicans who quickly evolved their position on LGBT rights um, on both sides of the aisle. So, um, again, celebrating would definitely be an aid, uh, especially if that celebration was to a, lo- a provable large enough base that they care. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. So this is why it's really important to get as many people as possible to sign the pro-truth pledge that creates the base for people, for politicians, for media figures, for anyone who is a public figure to care. So that's the aspiration, to get as many people as possible to sign the pledge. Now, we have a stick also for, you know, for people who don't abide by the terms of the pledge. You know, it's not like a, you know, you just take the pledge and, well, woohoo, there, there you go. Right. We have a clear monitoring mechanism. So one of the things that people can sign up to do when they sign up to be pro truth pledge advocates is to monitor other people who took the pledge who are public figures, whether it's media figures, whether it's politicians, whether, I don't know, corporate uh, CEOs and so on. They can sign up to be monitors. And that so a pro truth pledge advocate, if someone notices that, uh, let's say uh, the mayor of San Francisco signed up to the pro-truth pledge. And somebody in San Francisco who is a pro-truth pledge advocate notices that the mayor of San Francisco said something that uh, the pro-truth pledge advocate believes violates the pro-truth pledge is, is a lie. Then the pro-truth pledge advocate is asked to not make a big deal about it, to just privately go to the mayor and ask for a clarification with a very innocent until proven guilty Presumption, kind of maybe the advocate misunderstood what the mayor said, or maybe the mayor misspoke. Not a big deal. So then if the mayor retracts his words, that's great. We celebrate updating. If the advocate misunderstood, that's fine. No harm, no foul. Now, if the mayor doesn't retract his words and the advocate still believes there's a violation, then the matter goes to a mediating committee. And this is a committee made up of vetted volunteers. So anyone who signs up to the approach of pledge can be an advocate. 
and we don't want people to troll the pledge. <laughs> right. So we yeah. don't want people to set, to just sign up and then kind of you know oh these are all liars, right? So we have now we have vetted volunteers who we can rely on and trust who are on the mediating committee and who evaluate the evidence presented by the advocate. If they find that evidence valid, they talk with the mayor, they get in touch with the mayor's office, try to get the mayor to explain, get the mayor to retract his words. And again, if the mayor retracts, that's great. If the mayor doesn't, and the mediating committee thinks that there's still a violation, they call in someone from the central committee of the pro-truth pledge, the central coordinating committee. So that's kind of the overarching body of the pro-truth pledge. And again, we want that to make sure that there's a thorough process of evaluation and that the pledge can't be trolled or very low likelihood of it being trolled and corrupted. So wow. as it gets bigger, we, we are worried about that. We yeah. have been planning ahead for that. Make right. a better so, troll trap, they'll make better trolls. Um, yes, exactly. So, so, and finally, yeah. if the person from the Central Coordinating Committee confirms the finding, then the mayor is placed in contempt of the pro-truth pledge. And that's a pretty big deal. So the mayor is listed on the public website of the pro-truth pledge is in contempt of the pledge. There's a media advisory issued to all the media in the San Francisco area about the mayor being in contempt of the pro-truth pledge. And all the people in the San Francisco area who signed up to the pro-truth pledge and for action alerts as part of the pro-truth pledge get an action alert saying that the mayor is in contempt of the pro-truth pledge, asking them to tweet the mayor, email the mayor, write the mayor, call the mayor, and write uh, to letters to the editor and so on, post on Facebook about the mayor being in contempt of the pledge and providing all the evidence from the committee. So this is a pretty big reputational hit. So again, the, repu the other side, the stick aspect of it. This is a pretty okay. big reputational hit. And so it's very unlikely that somebody uh, would actually sign the pledge if they intend to deliberately deceive. Now, if they made a mistake, that's not a big deal. If They'll they, just easily attract their words. If but, they even yeah. understand the ramifications, and most likely this is going to be kind of one of those end-user license agreements where they'll go ahead and they'll take the pledge and not care be, because that's mm -hmm. just predictable. And then later on, they're going to get stung. Yeah, but I think it's more likely because there's there's all these steps. The single advocate's probably not going to raise an eyebrow, but no. once yeah. the the first committee hits and he's getting a lot more questions, it, it, just ten people, ten people asking you the same question, immediately forces you to reevaluate your position. Um, so Unless I you're think Trump. <laughs> but th 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 there, there are degrees. Yes, but, there are degrees. <laughs> but r reasonable folks, one person asking you a question may not for force you to reevaluate your position. But when you're just approached, it doesn't take a lot of people. It just takes a, a, a concerted, small effort, and they may actually reevaluate and go, oh, I made a mistake. Let me update. And it, it, it ends there. I, I don't see this for those who actually sign up for the pledge, it getting past that first committee. That that takes a very closed-minded in, individual or somebody who is very very set in their ways. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we haven't seen anybody like that now, have we? I doubt <laughs> that they'd sign the approach of pledge in that case uh, because true. You know, yeah. <laughs> we have. Uh, I mean, we've gone to a number of politicians and offer them the opportunity and there are some who have taken it and plenty who have not because they can see the ramifications coming down the road yeah and so politicians tend to be you know smart folks so they wouldn't get where they are uh, especially the yeah. higher up you go there they tend to be uh, smart in terms of cunning not yeah. necessarily intellectual S or self-interest yeah yes yeah, self-interest so they are quite capable of seeing that you know, it's going to be a big blow up kind of media situation with media advisories being issued. I mean, if you sign a pro truth pledge and if there's a thorough process demonstrating that you violated the pro truth pledge and then you choose not to retract your words and you're placed in contempt of the pro truth pledge and you're getting a lot of people sending you tweets and letters to the editor and there's Axis. media advisories. Yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> like, you know, uh, ringing your phone. You don't want that. <laughs> Protesting okay. outside your office. It's kind of, okay. It gets nasty. Let's get to the nitty-gritty yeah. here. Has this happened yet? How far along the road 
are we? How oh, how uh, uh, yeah. you know how many uh, newsletters have already gone out? When did it go live? The Pro Truth Pledge went live about a month ago. We have about 500 people who signed up. We have um, both Republican and Democratic politicians who signed up, more Democrats than Republicans, because one of the tenets of the pledge is that uh, science, the scientific consensus, is one of the ways we use to determine the truth. And so you're going to have you know, a lot of climate change deniers on the Republican side who are not going to sign up. I mean, you'll have some anti-vaxxers on the Democratic side who won't sign up, yeah. which is also okay. That's fine. Yeah. We are not we're not trying to be partisan. We're trying to orient toward the truth. It just happens to be the case that the Republicans are lying more right now. And that's just the case, just as it is. Yeah. So we have more lie. Democrats uh, signed up, but we have some Republicans and some most we have many Democratic um, talk show hosts and so on, you know, skating atheist, Aaron Rye, especially in the reason oriented community. We are starting to go to the reason oriented community first, which is why we went in this going on this radio show, <laughs> as early adopters. Thank you. <laughs> as kind of, you know, people who are likely to adopt the pledge early onward and prove a disseminating mechanism. So some of the people who sign up uh, become advocates and they go and they get their friends to sign up and so on. So, and the, it, so it's that's proving where, your base so that when you, you press further with other public figures, you can go, the numbers affect you. Yeah, exactly. And right yeah, now, it's a weight we of have, numbers. Yep. We already have situations like there was a congressperson. Yeah, congressman. Yeah, that was my next day. question. It's like, have has anything actually hit yet? Yes. Okay. We had a congressman. Um, Who's a person who's running for Congress, so candidate for a Congress position in Idaho, post a tweet from Trump and his Facebook wall, like another ridiculous tweet. And then somebody went on Trump's feed and said, like, hey, I can't find this tweet on Trump's feed. And so then the Congress person went, the congressman, uh, the Congress, what a candidate, mm -hmm. went on Trump's feed and couldn't find the tweet. And he then he edited his Facebook post and said, well, because I took the pro-truth pledge, I'm editing this Facebook post. You know, Trump may have deleted the tweet or it may have been a Photoshop tweet. I can't tell. But because I can't tell and because I took the pro-truth pledge, I retract my original statement that this is an actual Trump tweet and say this may not have been. Even Solid. calling it out. That's beautiful. Solid. Okay. So, And as this gains steam, it'll be detrimental eventually for the people who have not taken the pledge. Exactly. No, it, it does have a, a strong reminiscence of the early environmental campaign. So, no, I, and using proven, <laughs> proven methodology is always a good thing. Facts matter. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, that's, Let's hope they will. <laughs> that numbers matter. And, and the numbers end of the day, matter. at the end of the day, they're all measuring their 401k based on the same numbers that we are. You know, <laughs> so... Facts do matter in certain regards. They they do yes. follow certain things. Um, like we said, you know, we, if, even if we feel that there's a million dollars in our bank account, exactly. No, no <laughs> there's not enough zeros there. Not not enough. Um, okay, so I I like to look at things as sometimes pessimistically as possible. <laughs> That's one of the things that my oh, rational really? mind. It's like okay. How can this go horribly wrong? You know, that kind of thing. So sure. um, the way that you've described it is that there is there is an organization that is kind of uh, – it's not just – it doesn't seem to be just volunteer-based. So It is a volunteer-based organization, but okay. it's run by a nonprofit, Intentional Insights. It's a, The nonprofit is all volunteer, Okay, but, you know, I am – I am the volunteer president of a nonprofit. It has a board. It's been in existence for three years. Mm -hmm. It has collaborated with a number of well-recognized organizations, Secular Student Alliance, American Humanist Alliance, and so on. So we have a pretty good track record. Okay, of, excellent. So, the, yeah, I was wondering, it's like, because another another thing that we do is follow the money. So who's paying for this? Blah, 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 blah. And, you know, and, and go along those lines. So yeah, you're, you're being backed by a 501c3... Uh, Yep. organization. So 501c3 and donors, ordinary people like you and me and you know every all the listeners and so on. Yeah, the our financial base 
is basically monthly donors who give anywhere from two dollars a month to a um, hundred dollars a month. So that's our financial base. That's that's who's that's who's paying for it. Is send me a link afterwards so that I can put in the show notes how we could support this ongoing financially as well, because th- this is the kind of thing that it does need some capital to keep going. Because Absolutely. with capital never hurts. Capital never ever hurts. You know. I think I learned yeah, that from yeah, a Republican. Uh, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps the most important question of the night. Uh, I'm looking on your website. Where is the Pro Truth Pledge swag store? Oh, it's on the mer- okay. It's on the merchandise question. Okay. So on Pro Truth Pledge and ProTruthPledge.org, you can bring up uh, the we- you can bring up the website again, Andy. Uh, there's a merchandise button. Uh, so there's two things. Um, at the top, yep. yeah. At the top, you can go to merchandise. And you'll see a whole bunch of T-shirts and caps and hat and you know all, all other sorts of swag. So that's one of the things that uh, people who want to be advocates can get and just share the pledge that way. Wear the brooch of pledge. <laughs> I like the hoodie. The hoodie's good. Excellent. Uh, I'm a T-shirt I, guy myself. Fortunately, I'm a... fortunately, fortunately, you're white, so you can wear it. Oh, oh. And Ouch. there's the truth. It's um, true. And, and that <laughs> statement is backed up by the years 2016, <laughs> 2015. Uh, it, I think it's backed up all yeah. the way to uh, before the founding of this nation, David. <laughs> it was going to take me a while to get through all the years. It's pretty backed up. Yeah. 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 I think that could be an entire episode, honestly. <laughs> True enough. Oh, it's like, have you ever counted to a million? <laughs> Just... <laughs> Start. No, but I can count to at least about two fifty. <laughs> about two fifty. Nice. It, it's nice. it's 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 gonna be a little longer. It might be. Um, it might be a little bit longer. But I I definitely like the hat because quite often when you are out there and possibly on somebody's campaign trail, and maybe have your press badge and having the hat can definitely cue them up to what is likely you're going to ask them. Uh so. Uh, definitely a fan. And it definitely, you know, it counters the make America great again. Hats. Yes. And it doesn't have, and it doesn't have like, you know, uh, let's, you know, bash Trump. It's not like an anti-Trump no. thing. It's just no, it's, true. It's something that liberals and conservatives can agree on. Uh, reasonable conservatives and reasonable liberals. I, you know, I just noticed, and maybe I'm slow tonight, but the, the uh, the iconography that you have for the Pro Truth Pledge, the little icon with the light bulb in the yes. in the Chevron style thing there, that's a that's a pen quill, right? Yes, that's that is exactly tip. right. It combines a pen with a light bulb. I love it. That's great. Yes, Lexi Holiday made it. She's she's a great uh, she's a volunteer and she's a great graphic designer. So zoom, zoom in a little, zoom in a little more on that one. Yeah. That that is that is an excellent icon. Yeah, that's great. And actually, it takes me back to my theater days where we had ghost lights that looked like that. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. The the ghost light being the light that you'd put on stage for safety, so people don't fall in the pit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's yeah. excellent. Okay, so I'm I'm digging the swag, and I'm digging the pledge, and um, do. You, so again, dark side. <clears throat> sure. Just oh, real dear. quick, you know, because I know we're we're <laughs> running out of time with you, and you've been very gracious with your time so far, and, and we definitely want to have you back for all the other things sure. you do, um, and for updates. Yes, definitely yes. updates. Um, in fact, um, well, well, I guess we'll we'll talk on, offline on that because maybe there there could be something that we could add as a segment or just you know some recurring thing to say. Sure. What's up with the pledge? You know, I can do that. who said good things, who didn't do good things, you know, and just see, <laughs> Actually, take a um, measurement it, of, of how things are going. Quickly suggest maybe a uh, seasonal episode. Just oh, like every, dedic- qu- every quarter or something? Yeah, every quarter, just dedicate an hour, check back in with you, and see where we are. That might be a lot of time, but I wouldn't mind. Okay, so Trump was threatening to increase uh, the availability of libel laws. Mm-hmm. So 
in this, again, if you have some very zealous watchdogs out there that are that are keeping an eye on on pledge takers, um, <laughs> is there is there any mechanisms in place uh, knowing that that kind of thing is is likely to happen? Libel laws? Yeah. How, where, would, that how would that influence uh, the pledge? Uh, where it where going through the the whistleblowing segment. They are claiming that it's fallacious and and all that. I, I imagine so, through through the tiers that you have set up that that's probably <laughs> going to be taken care of. But I'm just yes, thinking exactly. If the tiers are how can we meant shoot holes in this? But sure, happy <laughs> to talk about that. So we have thought about that for quite a while when we're setting it up. That's why we made such a tiered system mm -hmm. uh, where the actual public punishment, the reputational punishment, the thing that would be, you know, invoke a libel, yeah. might potentially invoke a libel claim, comes as a result of a very thorough evaluation where we are very comfortable. People who are organizing, the organizers of the pledge, are very comfortable that we are standing on very firm ground that this person definitely lied mm -hmm. and that they definitely have give, been given many chances to retract their lie and have chosen not to do so. Libel is about somebody who is essentially lying about somebody in a way to harm their reputation. And we wouldn't be lying. We right. would be harming their reputation based on the truth, which is totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect answer. That's what I wanted to hear. Okay. Love it. Well, Gleb, you've, you've been very kind and gracious with your time, and it looks like it's about time for you to turn into a pumpkin and get back to your lovely wife. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us here on O'Reilly Radio, and you are welcome back anytime you have new information to share or just want to give us an update on, uh, on how things are going. And, uh, well, I have I a question for you, uh, for the three of you. Oh, yeah. Now that you talked about the pledge, Andy, David, and Daniel, will you take it? Oh, most yes. definitely. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, remember to note that you are public figures, and they include the public include uh, a paragraph so with a link to the show because I think people would deserve to hear. So, all three of you, please do so. Uh oh, I think that would be great. You just call us public figures, guys. You are I public know. figures. Oh, you no. are public figures. You make a public impact, just like I'm a public figure. You know, True. no legends who took it as a public figure. Aaron Ra who took it as a public figure. All podcasters are public figures by the definition of being a podcaster. <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. We, we're oh, legit. Dear. Now, I, now I just right. I need to get you the press credentials, guys. I got I got to go ahead and get the press badges. Out. The official. Okay. All right. All Thank right. you, Gleb. It's yes, you'll have you'll have at least three more signatures on there. Yeah. And public the figures. Night. <laughs> happy, to, happy to hear that. Wonderful. All right, guys. It's Thanks been a so pleasure. much. Thank we'll you. See you next time. If you've enjoyed what we've done here and you'd like to help us out, there's a few ways. You can donate to the show through www.patreon.com slash O'Reilly Radio and get early access to full show content. You can also make the algorithms work for us by reviewing us on iTunes to boost our ranking. Use your words, tell somebody about us, and of course, engage with us. Send us messages on the social medias or the electronic mails at O'Reilly Radio Podcast at gmail.com. Or if you're the more talkative sort, we've got 470-222-ORLY, that's 6759, always ready to take your call or your text. And if you don't like what we've done here this evening, you can contact the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255, available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. The Lifeline provides free and confidential support for people in distress, prevention and crisis resources for you and your loved ones, and best practices for professionals. Thank you for choosing to waste your valuable time on us. This has been a really Radio, part of the Random Acts Company. This work licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 United States license, including the music Rocket and Pemgia, created by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. And go take that pledge, would you? Thanks, everybody. See you next week.